OSU is the leader in unmanned aircraft systems, the number one university in design build fly systems. OAIR, or Oklahoma Aerospace Institute for Research and Education, is really that cornerstone, the institution that brings all those expertise together under the umbrella of Oklahoma State University. Launchpad is funded by the EDA as part of the Build Back Better program, and it's an overall $39 million grant from the EDA to help support economic development within the Tulsa region. Launchpad is in partnership with Tulsa Innovation Lab and Oklahoma State University. What it is is the home for advanced technology research and development for unmanned systems to train our next generation of engineers right in Tulsa. And then it also has wraparound supports for entrepreneurs so that we can turn those technologies into companies that are now growing in our region. And Launchpad is a way for the community, for entrepreneurs to partner with OAIR and primarily be there to help support research and development activities around advanced air mobility. And when we say advanced air mobility, we really think drones that can carry people. Figuring out how air taxis will work and how they'll incorporate into an existing ecosystem, urban or rural, and kind of testing what those boundaries look like. So NASA will be involved as well. We do a lot of research with NASA. NASA's always been kind of the, the big dog in aerospace and space. We are really appreciative of having multiple projects with them. OAIR is you know, not just drones. We've been really focused on the autonomous applications, but also on much larger aerospace applications, which are really impactful for Oklahoma. The goal of projects and programs like this is to lift Tulsa up on a national scale. Industry partnerships are key and critical to this program, and this program allows them a front door for how they can engage with our university, with our students, with our young people in our region. When we talk about OAIR, it's not just about supporting aerospace engineering, but it's the aerospace industry across the state and all the jobs that go into the aerospace industry. For companies that normally wouldn't necessarily be able to play in the same sandbox, we are building the sandbox so that everyone can kind of come to the table. The first thing we knew when Tulsa Innovation Labs got started is that OSU has something special. It has something special, it's nationally unique. We just really are looking to build that sandbox in the sky and be able to support that with the expertise and excellence that OSU has spent the last 20 years developing and cultivating. Really the applications are limitless in terms of how we design these systems to help us solve problems better. OAIR really is here to help support the current industry but also set it on a path for the 21st century. Oklahoma State's a land-grant university. It's teaching, research, and extension, and at the center of all that are our students. And we're graduating generations of students that go out into this industry at the cutting edge of technology. All right, everybody, welcome back to your Dawn of Autonomy podcast. I am Dawn Zola, your host, and the CEO of P3 Tech Consulting, and if you haven't figured it out by now, we've got Oklahoma State University in the house. Dr. Jamie Jacobs is with us. And let me tell you, if you weren't excited by some of the things we just saw in that video, I think you all need to be checking your pulse. <laughs> Make sure you're still alive because this is so exciting. Jamie, so great to have you on the show. Oh, well, thank you uh, for having me. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. You know, Jamie was on our Full Tilt Tech Industry Leadership Talks show last year. So if you want to know a little bit more about him, actually a lot more about him and what he's been doing, check that episode out. But for those that haven't had a chance to see that yet, Jamie, or don't know you, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself? Sure, sure. So uh, Jamie Jacob, a professor of aerospace engineering here at Oklahoma State University, an executive director of Oklahoma Aerospace Institute for Research and Education, uh, or as we call it, uh, OAIR. And that's really an umbrella organization across the OSU campuses that pulls together our various aerospace resources. And obviously, you know, a lot of my focus is on autonomy uh, and you know advanced air mobility, but you know that you know, includes both traditional and I would say emerging aerospace uh, technologies. Well, you kind of already gave us the mission statement there, and and for. Look, Jamie, a lot of the folks out in this crowd are very familiar with the drone world and kind of what's been happening. And I'll tell you, I think it was what last year, the year before where Oklahoma 
skyrocketed to number one on that state journal preparedness list. And it, it really, I think, took took people, you know, took them aback, but you've got so much going on. And frankly, what you're doing at OSU and then of course now with Tulsa Innovation Labs and the corridor and everything else that's going on, you've been a huge part of that. Uh, well, yeah, and this has been a long time coming and we have a, a great team here uh, across the state of Oklahoma. Of course, you know, you know, James Grimsley very well and what he's currently doing uh, with, with the Choctaw Nation. Uh, but, you know, across the entire spectrum, you know, whether it's our Department of Commerce, uh, Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics, uh, and of course, the, the universities uh, as well. And I, you know, I think, you know, we started this uh, really as one of the, the first states to go to, you know, AUVSI, for example, as a team and said, hey, let's, you know, have a full statewide presence. And what we can, what can we do to leverage the unique assets? that each one of our team members have. And obviously I've been very focused on the university side and we already had a really great drone program, you know, starting off um, you know, in the early 2000s and just been building upon that ever since. Absolutely, and by the way, everybody, I'd be remiss not to mention, of course, this is education month, which is why Jamie is here. And this month is sponsored by USI, so we thank them. And uh, Jamie, we're looking, I mean, we're coming up on AEVSI Exponential and we're all looking forward to meeting you in person. And I know USI is going to be running around the floor as well. So uh, I think they've got a booth as, uh, as well. So it should be a great time, you know, bringing the whole industry together. But let's talk about OAIR. You know, you said it was an umbrella organization kind of across your institution and there's different components to it. Can you break those components down? Sure. Yeah. And it, it, so OER is an institute. So, you know, we actually sit outside uh, the colleges at the university. So, you know, we're essentially on the equivalent of a, a college, for example. And our goal is to be able to provide better connectivity across the colleges and really pulling some of those uh, emerging technologies, the, the foundational uh, you know, things that faculty and graduate students and undergraduates are working on in their laboratories in figuring out, well, how do we get them across that valley of death you know, into the hands of end users? What can we do to help innovate that um, and you know, commercialize it and put that out into uh, the, the whole eco, ecosystem? And so with that, you know, we're working with different groups. And I always kind of liken this back to when we originally started thinking about forming the Institute. Um, you know, as we were developing our own you know, drone program um, and you know, building up the, the UAS expertise that we had across the university, we got calls from all, not just across campus, but across uh, from across the state. And, you know, folks in geology or geography, plant soil sciences, or your extension programs. And the first question was almost always the same. I have a drone. Now, what do I do with it? Yeah. <laughs> we always go back and say, well, first off, is is a drone the right answer to this your problem that you have? So let's come back as it's always about data at the end of the day. You know, how do I get data? Uh, and so it's thinking about what kind of data is it that you need? And then from that, determining, well, is a drone the right solution? And if it is, you know, what kind of system do you need? Um, you know, maybe there's, you know, a, another unmanned system or uncrewed system uh, that we could use instead of the aerial application to be able to get what you need. You know, the, the drone or the UAS piece is always a sexy one, but it's not always the best answer uh, to the problem. And really, we've just been building this expertise and capability uh, since then. But also, you know, traditional aerospace is a backbone here in Oklahoma. We have the largest uh, MRO facility on the military side in Oklahoma City and on the commercial side in Tulsa. And so you're know, helping support those because that's where most of our students go. And if we you know, step back and think about this from the education standpoint, not just at the university, but K through 12, non-traditional um, you know, students, you know, those are part of our customers as well. And then you know, two year in certification program. So it's not just thinking about the four year and advanced degrees, but what do we need to help support both traditional and emerging aviation industries on that workforce? And I hate to use this word pipeline, you know, cause it pipe, a pipe does a really poor job of explaining what this is. We like to use the term braided river because we have lots of things coming in 
and lots of pathways going out because there are so many great careers that you can have in aerospace. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm just going to flip this around for you a second because, you know, we always talk about drones and we're going to talk about a lot of the different programs and, and research and development you have going on in that space. But, you know, counter drone is something that has really taken a, a you know, front seat basically on the world stage as we're watching what's happening in you know, Russia, Ukraine. I mean, for you and I, Jamie, this is no surprise, right, that we're seeing uh, commercial off the shelf drones used uh, in unprecedented ways, I'd say, on the battlefield and, you know, the implication that has to the homeland. So part of what you do also is counter UAS, right? You have a counter UAS center of excellence. Does that fall under OAIR or is that something separate? It, it does. So OAIR as an institute houses various centers and we'll, we'll talk about the, the counter UAS center uh, first. And that's a very interesting story because that actually the, the first meeting that we had to help support that center was with the Fires Battle Lab from Fort Sill, uh, which now houses the Joint Counter Small UAS University. So if you're somewhere in the DOD uh, and you're going to get counter US training, you now do that at Fort Sill, uh, it, as well as many of our allies. It's exciting to go down there and you see NATO and ANZUS um, members, you know, sending their folks there uh, to, to get trained. But that initially started oddly enough, from an educational initiative. Uh, one of my colleagues here, Professor Andy Arena, which is really the reason that I came to OSU because of the design build fly expertise they had built purely from the standpoint of teaching students about the implications of their design choices. So in, in my era, when we were going through what we call our senior or our capstone design, it was a paper plane, meaning everything was in a report. Our yeah. job was to design an airplane, put it in report, and that was our deliverable. Uh, and that doesn't tell the whole story. And so no. the emergence of using remote control aircraft as a teaching tool initially led then to this conversation that we had with the Fires Battle Lab from Fort Sill to say, hey, you guys are building drones. We know drones are going to be an issue moving forward. How do we stay ahead of this challenge on the battlefield to make sure that we're keeping the U.S. warfighter safe? And so that from that idea with the army sprung this entire center. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's really focused around uh, the, the counter UAS piece. And so what we what we do are identify threats uh, and then try to replicate those. So threat replication is a big component of this, which is, well, how do we uh, from limited intelligence? You know, maybe it's a DJI. And, you know, these are things like, for example, ISIS was using in the, you know, the, around 2015. And that's very easy for us to say, oh, there's a photo of a system that's being used in Iraq. How do we replicate that in the laboratory? And then throw that against, you know, a, a controlled scenario so you can test what those detect, identify, and defeat mechanisms are. Um, or it may be, you know, a set of photos, you know, that you have and say, well, how do we then take that unknown aircraft and replicate that as close as we can. Uh, so again, that way we can evaluate how well the technology is working on you know, a training ground in the US before it goes overseas. Um, and the last component of that is then threat casting, which is, well, how do we think of threats out in the future? You know, things such as dark targets, which are low radar cross section, um, you know, fast movers, so now they're using gas turbine jet engines to be able to propel themselves, or artificial intelligence, so that way we have systems that are now swarming and are really acting in a more intelligent fashion. And of course, you know, we see all these autonomous applications really coming to bear uh, in all these happening, you know, at once right now. And so uh, I always hate to say this is kind of an exciting piece of what's happening in the counter UAS space. Um, uh, but it certainly is very uh, interesting. And then using the students then to come up with those new ideas and really help push that technology forward. And one example of that I like to throw in is we have undergraduate students that have been working on you know, using these systems for uh, mine and unexploded ordnance detection. Uh, and some of that technology is now being used in Ukraine. Yeah, I, I know they're, they're using that in Ukraine. I know uh, one of our strategic partners, Dragonfly, uh, that's one of the use cases they're using their Commander 3XL for. So it's a very important and humanitarian use case on the battlefield, to be sure. Now, I want to talk for a second about partners, right, Jamie? Because 
you mentioned uh, almost like technology transfer where people will come to you with their problems, you know, businesses, whatever. I assume for this counter uh, UAS Center of Excellence, Department of Homeland Security is one of those customers. And not only that, but like other people can plug into this effort. So I want to make sure that that we are clear with our audience how they can participate, you know, even if they're not a student, how they can bring their problem sets to you. What does that look like? Is there some other pathway to plug into this particular center or others? Yeah, and that's a great question uh, because, you know, our role as a university is really to serve as their, that intermediary. And we really see ourselves as the trusted agent between the federal government and other government agencies who are the end users, and it might be DOD or DHS, uh, and then the companies that are developing the products. So in addition to helping you know, determine what those threats are, it's also determining a, an evaluation standard so that way we can provide a gold stamp uh, to certain technologies um, to, to help solve this problem, but at the same time work with the companies to figure out you know, where their speed bumps are at to help get them over the edge before those systems then go out into the field and then are used uh, by the government and customers. Uh, so consortium on the industry side to really help with them um, to, to work with that technology, but also working one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, sometimes that may be as simple as, oh, we're acting as a red team to throw the threats at the system that they're developing or you know, bringing their system in house and saying, well, let's put this in a you know, uh, RF chamber to be able to, to test you know, how well your uh, jamming system is working, uh, for example. But there are so many things in that DID uh, space. There's not just one way. There is no one good solution right now to be able to solve the counter UAS problem. No, absolutely. Now, with regards to uh, plugging into this center, as an example, uh, is there some kind of a membership? You know, I, I remember when I was at a different university, I'm not going to say which one, you know, they had a pretty big center and um, uh, a company I know was a member there. So that gave them the right to like use their conference facilities, uh, some kind of an annual fee. Uh, and then they participated, you know, maybe in some of the conferences and other things that that, that center put on. Do you have something similar? We, we do. So we have an industry consortium uh, that uh, industry members can join. And so that way we can work with them uh, directly. And that's housed uh, under what we call the Innovation Foundation, uh, which is really our leadership organization, really focused on you know, how do we work with industry uh, to be able to, to spearhead those solutions and, you know, make sure we get the technology of the university out in the hands of end users. Okay. Well, that's, that's smart. So we talked about this, uh, the counter UIS center of excellence. You have other centers. Can you give us the pretty quick around the world? Because I want to get to community engagement and some of the other things you're doing in Oklahoma with the Tulsa innovation labs and, and advanced or mobility, et cetera. So, What's the structure? You've got OAIR, you've got Counter US Center of Excellence under that. You've got this innovation. Uh, what did you just call it? Innovation Foundation. Innovation Foundation that helps kind of leverage that consortium and bring stakeholders in. What What are the other centers? Yeah, it, the other major center uh, is a Launchpad Center, and, and that's focused on the OSU Tulsa campus. And again, we have a lot of partners with that, which includes the Tulsa Innovation Laboratory, Skyway 36, uh, which the Skyway range is born out of. Uh, and, and that is really focused around uh, developing entrepreneurship, helping smaller businesses you know, get into this drone space. And this kind of comes back to this whole issue that we have right now, really focused around um, you know, supporting U.S. manufacturers, you know, how do we get around not just the U.S. manufacturing supply chain problem, but also some of those cyber and security issues. Uh, and so the Launchpad piece or the Launchpad Center is really focused around helping support that uh, particular uh, initiatives that we have. And spinning out of that is really throwing in the capability to do urban flight testing. And that touches a lot of different components of uh, what we have, which includes you know, things such as urban air mobility, um, you know, weather and micro weather research working directly 
um, you know, with you know, folks such as uh, Skyway 36, uh, which is our one of our partners uh, on the, the Launch Pad Center project uh, through the Osage Nation, which is to support standing up their capabilities um, to be able to have uh, flights capabilities. And you'll see an example of that here uh, with one of our OAR research engineers uh, performing flights at the Skyway 36 uh, drone port just north of here. And that's really our anchor facility that we have that connects both the Osage Nation Skyway range uh, with the urban flight test cap capabilities within Tulsa. Wow. So for those that, that didn't see the movie, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon was about the Osage Nation. And um, they are uh, a, a large community uh, within the Tulsa area that, that works uh, with OSU and, and is doing just like the Choctaw Nation, incredible things in the aerospace domain. Uh, so tell us about this uh, Skyway 36, because um, I don't think everybody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's Skyway 36, a uh, drone port facility, which is owned and operated by uh, the, the Osage Nation or their business arm, Osage LLC, is you know really focused around developing a capability to support industry team members to come in, uh, do ground testing, you know, through some of their other partners, such as Windshape, uh, which is, you know, standing up an environmental wind tunnel test facility to test at full scale across a, a range of environmental conditions, and we'll be presenting a, a seminar on that at AUVSI coming up. Uh, and then, you know, getting out into both the unpopulated low-risk airspace uh, over the Osage Nation, and then connecting back into uh, Tulsa for urban air mobility uh, testing. And this, again, this really connects with everything that we have at the state level to be able to you utilize a lot of the unique assets that we have, all the great capabilities uh, that the Choctaw Nation has with the, the FAA Beyond program um, to our flight test facility at OSU and now this one uh, within the Tulsa region. Unbelievable. Uh, so I want to make sure that uh, I I'm not you know, kind of repeating what you just said, but you've got the the Sky Skyport 36 range, basically. Tell us about the Skyway range. This is this is the it's like a triangle. It's yeah, it's, it's actually uh, really setting up a mobile test facility, so that way under uh, the launch pad center, uh, our various uh, you know detection and, and monitoring capabilities to to allow access uh, to the airspace. Uh, you know, things such as radars, uh, you know, visual and IR uh, tracking systems, acoustic detection systems, uh, and then radio communication systems. Uh, and we have a, one of our partners, Yavionics, is really helping support the latter. So that way we can provide this connectivity, um, you know, with UAS operations uh, within conflicted uh, airspace. And so it's a little bit of a different, you know, model in the sense, you know, the Choctaw Nation part of the Beyond program, yeah, um, you know, has this direct relationship with the FAA. And what we're doing is, you know, through the the Skyway range as well. How can we now work with the FAA under the auspices of access to the national airspace to be able to get early adopters that flight testing capability that the that they need? So working with them in laboratory in the Launch Pad Center at OSU. Uh, doing the test and ground test um, with uh, with wind shape at Skyway 36, and then moving out into the the Skyway range, and then eventually into Tulsa uh, for urban air operations. Oh, that that's incredible! And I know you've been successful, even though you're not formally in the Beyond program. Not many people are. Let's face it. Uh, at obtaining some pretty significant waivers for specialized systems over 10,000 feet above ground level. Uh, well, yeah, and again, these are all tend to be really unique systems. I have to be careful, right? They, <laughs> well, claim, exactly. I mean, you, know, you have to, everything. We tend to invent things that we haven't, but yeah, that, for example, was uh, for you know, uh, Toyota as a customer uh, and, you know, doing something really specific specific for them for a technology that, uh, that they were developing. And again, that's where I think, you know, these industry relationships with universities work so well. Uh, where we can help fill in some of those gaps, not just in terms of research development, but capabilities, you know, for, for things such as 
uh, you know, airspace access that are often difficult for a company that aren't working in this space 100% of the time, uh, because it is a pretty unique niche to be able to develop, um, you know, access and you know, go through the process of making sure that you're getting these uh, waivers and, you know, certificates, um, you know, through the correct channels. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, breach into the choir there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, speaking of kind of unique uh, programs, unique research that you've been doing, tell us about this Grand Slam launch that, that you do. Yeah, and this is actually exciting right now because we were leading up to, to the eclipse as part of this. Uh, and so ballooning is one of those areas that we do. So, um, you know, Toyota, for example, was a uh, high altitude kite systems that we were developing for that 10,000 foot ballooning goes back uh, a long ways with this partnership in particular uh, is working directly with NASA JPL Sandia National Laboratories to develop high altitude balloon systems for eventual use of all things on Venus. So when we think about, you know, these long term, long range applications, it's very difficult for a company to come in and say, hey, I want to fly something on Venus someday. That's where your universities and government labs really come in. Uh, and in this case, it's developing these high altitude, what we call solar balloons or heliotropes uh, that essentially use the sun's energy uh, to be able to stay aloft for long periods of time. And so now we're talking about flying at 80,000 feet uh and above uh, with these high altitude systems wow that and, wait a minute i was just at the space symposium this week that's stratospheric it is okay see i learned something <laughs> yeah, it's already, yeah. i was wondering i was talking to my son yesterday and i was just geeking out uh you know so much so many cool technologies on the floor uh you know from robotic arms you know to to rovers um you know, it's a tents and, and suits. I mean, it's just, you know, just so cool. And and so that's, yeah, I, I'm deep into the space, space thing in my brain right now. But uh, hey, besides space and balloons, uh, you guys have also tackled tornadoes. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and it's interesting. My, my initial uh, interest, or I would say education into UAS, I uh, was working on a project for the National Severe Storms Laboratory as an undergraduate student. So again, tying this back into education for what they called at the time a tornado chaser. Um, and then, you know, went off to grad school, did my thing, uh, started back with NASA on developing aircraft, uh, part of the workforce development program for Mars, and then coming back to Oklahoma. And of course, weather is a big piece of, of everything that we do here uh, just due to the severe storm risk uh, that we have. So developing, returning to this tornado chaser concept um, has always been a passion of mine. There have been other folks that have been uh, you know, chasing this as well. Brian Argro at UC Boulder, uh, Adam Houston at University of Nebraska have really been pushing the boundaries of what's possible here. And so what we were wanting to do is take some of the technology that we had developed. In this case, this was another senior design project. Uh, this was a capstone team that had developed this aircraft purely for a counter U.S. military application, which is really? how do we design something that flies fast, has a low radar cross section, but at the same time, it be, became really easy for us to modify this to essentially be an up armored tornado chaser. How do you design something that can fly in this really uh, austere, severe storm environment that you can launch in the field relatively rapidly that can still get pummeled by hail and survive? That's amazing. You know, they uh, they just recycled, we'll call it the Twister movie. And uh, I'm going to be very curious to see if there's drones involved uh, in in that movie. I, I am, too. I'd be really disappointed. You know, some of the concepts they developed around the Dorothy, which you know, now sit at the National Weather Center here uh, in Oklahoma. We're using things very similar to them now, like very small systems that still fly in balloons. They're not, you know, uh, recycled soda cans like they did in the you know, original Twister. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're we're planning to fly those next week as part of a you know severe storm experiments ahead of a, a storm front that's moving through. Wow, that's well so critically important because we're still learning about weather and these storms can have devastating effects. Uh, you know, they they take property and lives, and so. To understand uh, them better, I think is is quite a noble endeavor. Um, 
you know, we're talking also about the future and you mentioned advanced air mobility. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I know that's something when we, we spoke with James Grimsley at Choctaw last month in our R and D to real world ops month, uh, which, which Choctaw sponsored, um, you know, they were talking about ha connecting uh, their area in Durant uh, with the Dallas Fort Worth area, some kind of a corridor. And that's, you know, that's the game plan. Tell us what you're doing in terms of launch pad and advanced drone mobility, like right now, and then where you see that going in the future. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned the Choctaw Nation and their plans to connect to, um, you know, DFW. You know, that's where the future is going to be able to take this low risk airspace and start to, to push into urban areas. And since, you know, OSU, uh, the campus that I'm actually sitting here today is located within urban Tulsa itself, this becomes a great facility for us to have an urban drone port. Uh, so with the capacity to be able to launch these systems, you know, directly in, uh, you know, into the urban space. And this actually ties into a NASA project that we have right now. Uh, it's a university leadership initiative, which is focused on you know, using drones to both help improve weather forecasting for micro weather scenarios by developing systems to get that data, but at the same time, real-time reporting. How do we get this, you know, like a pie rep, how do we use a drone rep to be able to get this information back to, you know, the unmanned traffic management network? Uh, so we have some of our research faculty, uh, doctors uh, Avian, uh, Avery and Azevedo, you know, working on this in terms of mapping this out and then hosting a conference uh, as well as a flight week here in the fall of 2024 uh, to be able to use Tulsa as an urban weather flight test range. So kind of a unique test environment. I'm hoping you're working with Don Bershaw from True Weather on that and his team because that is like his life passion. And, uh, you know, yeah. I know he's in a whole bunch of places, but I think he's. Yeah. It, and speaking of Don, we just got our, our first media drone system, um, you know, which we've flown to 18,000 feet already, which is really. Oh exciting. my gosh. Yeah. Mediomatic. Yeah. You know, I'm so excited because uh, uh, they're going to be at AVSI, Jamie. I don't know if you knew that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Great team members, again, you know, to be able to partner with them. And, you know, we're looking forward to flying that, you know, in some severe weather scenarios as well. Yeah, that, that's an incredible drone, like literally a flying weather lab. Uh, the Meteomatics Meteo drone is what we're talking about, everybody, if you didn't know. And uh, all right, so lots going on, lots of different R&D. You've got many centers. You're plugged into the local community. Let's talk a little bit more about that and community outreach. Um, what kind of programs do you have to engage your community uh, with regards to drones or counter drone or all the work, advanced air mobility, all the things you're doing? Yeah, I'll take it this back. I mentioned this braided river concept, right? And as yeah. Lane Grant University, we're really focused on, you know, serving the, the populace across the state. Uh, and so that in, you know, includes our urban citizens, our rural citizens, our tribal nation uh, members that we have. And you know, looking for those really unique opportunities for students to engage, and that's where they start to get excited about. Well, yeah, maybe you know, autonomy is the future for me. Nothing gets kids more excited than when you think, uh, you know, drones and robots or aircraft and robots, and you marry them well, together. Speaking of excited, Jamie, I love this picture we're showing right now because, like, when we talked about before we even started the show, I love the like pure joy uh, on this woman's face. Uh, so tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, well, first off, this is a uh, uh, you know two of our grad students at the time, uh, and Victoria Natali there on the left um, was uh, working on her master's, and she's now our director for strategic for strategic innovation uh, at O'Air. And so her job is to think about long range things. You know what we can what can we do in the in the future? Uh, she was just telling me the other day, man, I miss field work, right? And I think this just shows that in terms yeah. of yeah getting systems out there. And this was actually at the Choctaw Nation. Uh, we did their first test for one to many flights of three different aircraft types, six aircraft total, uh, under part 107 waivers up to 2,500 feet. And that was, you know, from several years ago now. But again, you know, being there, and I think everyone was just excited to be able to see that and you'll be part of that groundbreaking opportunity um, that we had there. Um, but we use these pathways, you know, it's whether whether it's K through 12, 
Um, you know, some of the stuff that we do here within uh, the Greenwood District within Tulsa, or working with our tribal nations around the state, you know, being able to engage and have students think about STEM careers, because that's obviously the real future of the U.S. economy is being able to support these and get these students uh, within the right pathways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you having success, Jamie, then in obtaining grant money to do this kind of outreach? Like you were talking about tribal outreach, some of, uh, I think you called uh, some of your students non-traditional students, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to uh, be able to support those efforts and uh, you know, those inspirational efforts to inspire them to want to become uh, part of this community when they yeah. uh, join the workforce. Yeah, and it's obviously always requires support, right? And so yes. whether it's from federal grants, state grants, or you know, private donations from uh, companies or philanthrop philanthropists, you know, bringing able to, to bring these work resources together and really put them to bear to have you know, unique opportunities for students to engage. Um, you know, students don't know what they don't know. And so you have to provide them some kind of resource so that way they can see that, oh, there might be a future here because you have to grab them early, right? If you don't have them by the time they're a middle school student, it's almost too late to have them in a STEM career, unfortunately. Um, so OSU has developed a new, what we call a polytech program, uh, which is now focused not just on the traditional four-year and graduate degrees, but two-year and certificate programs. So non-traditional students, you know, which might be those are already in the workforce, veterans coming out of the military, how do we get them the training so that well, they don't have time for a four-year degree, but they can have these certificate opportunities to be able to get this knowledge that they need to be able to get active in the workforce. I love that you're doing that, Jamie, because you know what? Not everybody needs to be, I mean, we love our aerospace and mechanical engineers, but not everybody needs to be one, right? To be part of this community and to have opportunities for a two-year program or to obtain a certificate that, and maybe also get your part 107 pilot's license, take a couple business classes, open up your own shingle or whatever it is you do, to give people opportunities to you know get involved and, and start building their own path. You know, I think that that's amazing. Well, and, and you know, and we're big proponents of lifelong learning. And I think there's no place that that's more evident of where it's needed than in autonomy. You, you know, look at um, you know, how far drones have come over the last decade. And you know, now we're on the cusp of incorporating. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in everyday operations. Yeah. Uh, and You're right. I mean, honestly, you know, you hear all these things about some professors being up in arms about AI and what's, you know, to me, it's, it, I, you know, I, I no longer teach at the university, um, you know, but if I did, part of what I think I'd be doing is teaching them how to harness, harness AI to use it. You know, I mean, to me, it's like the calculator for math. It, I mean, it is. Who does, like hand math. I mean, I guess engineers do, but for the most part, who like <laughs> nobody does hand math anymore. You know, like um, so. You know, I think that's what AI is, and we need to leverage that. And to your point, Jamie, I was, we were talking about this with Josh Olds at the beginning of the month. What you know from USI, the skill sets you're going to need in this industry are absolutely changing. This idea of kind of the human machine interface and, you know, you just said one to many, you know, it, it's very different to fly a drone, stick and rudder, if you will, right, with your ground controller, one to one than it is to be at a control center with a whole bunch of screens in front of you flying multiple drones at one time. That, that's, that takes different skill sets. It does. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, I know it's not particularly germane to this conversation, but I, I teach a course in physics of science fiction. And that allows us to think about, you know, these really future things that are out there, some that are, you know, maybe a century away, but some that are, we're just on the cusp of, and I require the students to use AI as part of their homework. So they have to interface with that because that is the future. And it we is. put up a barrier and say, well, we're not, we're just going to wall this off and not do it. Yeah. Um, and we need to have that, not just in our courses um, to teach them, but then also in our daily lives, because it's the thing that's going to make us more productive. And more effective at the end of the day. I just was at Duke Law uh, in February, and Brigadier General Linnell Latondra is the dean uh, at at the academy, Air Force Academy, and uh, her talk on AI. She literally 
put down a challenge to her faculty. Like she's requiring them to leverage and use AI in some way in every single one of the courses. So, you know, it's just like, all right, that that's at the Air Force Academy. Think about that for a second. Like, yeah. you know, that that's how significant this is. So let's talk about the future though, um, since we're kind of on that topic. Uh, what do you see in your crystal ball for OAR or some of your centers uh, coming down the pike, you know, maybe this year, next year, the next five years? Well, you know, we have some pretty exciting announcements that uh, we're going to be rolling out in 2024. Some will be at AUVSI themselves. So, you know, uh, stand by to, to see what those look like. Uh, but it's really about supporting, you know, things such as, you know, supply chain, uh, not just in UAS, but at aerospace, you know, across the entire ecosystem. Um, you know, things are changing so fast and aerospace is really such a critical um, you know, anchor and foundation, you know, again, not just for a state like Oklahoma, uh, where it's number two in our economy, just right behind energy and those sometimes change places, but for the entire United States uh, and making sure that the U.S. is still not the leader in aerospace, you know, is really one of our goals and our missions to be able to help support that. And what can we do to make sure that we're maintaining that lead? Yeah, um, I mean, cool. I think for, we'll have a lot of announcements on that. This, this big, year. okay, good. Big announcements coming, come some within the next few weeks. So that's very exciting. Uh, but I would agree with you, Jamie. I don't think the average citizen really fully appreciates, you know, other than you know, hopping on a commercial plane. And unfortunately, we've seen some bad stories coming out of like parts flying off lately. Uh, so that that's troubling. Uh, but I, I don't know that Joe Q citizen appreciates how much aerospace affects their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the GPS that they hop in their car or they just pull up their phone and they're going somewhere and tells them how to get there. All of that, for the most part, is coming from space and, you know, the the the, com the communication satellites, not just for the military, but for everybody. So, you know, just it's it's such a critical area uh, of practice. Um, so I, I love that someone like you is in there. I love everything you're doing uh, to inspire the next generation. And uh, clearly you're doing that. I mean, we saw the picture of your grad student who's now helping to lead one of your, you know, you, you, some of your efforts there. So that's that's just such a great success story. I'm sure one of a million you could share with us. Uh, but we are getting very close to the end of our time, Jamie. So I want to make sure uh, that we uh, we close with whatever it is that you you know want to want to leave the audience with that I forgot to ask you or you know, what, whatever that is, your concluding remarks. Well, no, I, I think, you know, I'd like to kind of just echo again, you know, going back to what you said in terms of technology, you know, a lot of this was really driven by investments that were made at the federal level in space and defense. And, you know, we see the benefits of this technology trickle out across the rest of the economy. And I think that's where I really want to leave things is to, to remind ourselves that, you know, if we're not making these coordinated efforts and investments uh, at the national level, which, you know, then come down to individual you know, companies and universities like OSU uh, spearheading these efforts, uh, then we are going to fall behind. And, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, the U.S. is still always at the forefront uh, of aerospace while also being, you know, a good uh, global partner uh, to our allies across the world. Uh, and you're know, using this technology, not just for exploration, but, you know, things like, you know, battling uh, climate change and you know, national security. There are so many areas where autonomy and UAS and advanced air mobility are going to be life changing and ubiquitous uh, over the coming decade. So it's very exciting to be operating in this space right now. Yeah, absolutely. And to echo what you said earlier, Jamie, you know, it's not just the federal level that needs to support. It's also private industry. And so uh, for the companies out there, if you haven't checked out what OSU is doing uh, and plugged into their efforts, now you know a little bit more. And this is just another great opportunity to become one of those consortium partners, get involved in Launchpad, or if you're counter UAS, that's your thing, get involved in that center. And great opportunity to meet Jamie and his team and some of his colleagues also from Oklahoma, I know the Wind Lab. I got an email from them that you know from that they're going to be at uh, Exponential as well. So uh, stay tuned for more big announcements. 
Uh, and Jamie, in the meantime, how can they reach you? Uh, so, you know, email is always the best way. Uh, JD Jacob at okstate.edu. Just please reach out. Come find our booth at AUVSI um, or, you know, just look us up online. So that works as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. I learned a ton and uh, I'm super excited to see what else is coming out of Oklahoma and OSU and, and your, your group, Jamie. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody out there. We are out here. Thank you.